So we did our first dot product example, and we're going to do some dot product properties now. So this will be the algebraic dot properties. Our vectors will be u, v, and w, and they'll be n-dimensional vectors, and we only need one scalar, I think, so alpha will be our scalar. So u dot v is v dot u. What property is that called? Commutative, Commutative property. Uh, <coughs> don't write what I'm about to write in red. Why does the triple dot product not make any sense? So u dot v, this will be a scalar. And then we, there's only one scalar product with the vector, and it's not the dot product, it's the scalar product. So doesn't make sense to have a triple dot product. So what that means is associativity you can't have, because you can't have two dot products in a row. So there is no associativity. Uh, we have, let's see, the reason we would call it a product, there are dis it distributes across addition. So here we have a dot product with a sum of vectors. And remember, sum of vectors, two vectors added together, is a vector. So it makes sense to add two vectors and then take a dot product with another vector. And the reason we call it a product is for this property right here. If, if it distributes across addition, we call it a product. So that's really what product means, is how it plays with addition. And you can move your scalar around. So if we have alpha u and that vector dot v, we could take the scalar outside, compute the dot product, and then multiply the scalar at the end. So we could do that. And I want to warn you, let's go to red. You may be tempted to make this incorrect algebra move. So if you try to do this, alpha uh, is a scalar product with a dot product. You can compute that. However, it's not equal to what I have on the board here. If we just look at what's on the board, this is equal to something. Using those rules, I'll bring the first alpha outside. And then I can bring the second alpha outside. So we got alpha alpha u dot v which of course is alpha squared. So you distribute, you don't distribute multiplication across multiplication. Just like in the good old days when things were numbers, if we had three times, two times, and here when I write dot, I mean times. Maybe it's better if I just explicitly write it out. This is not three times <coughs> two times three times four. You would think that's ridiculous if I try to do that with numbers. You don't distribute multiplication across multiplication, just like you don't here. You do distribute multiplication across addition. So I just want to warn you right there, alpha times the dot product, you don't distribute the alpha, the scalar multiplication across products. You never distribute products across products. So that's the moving your scalar around. And last property. If you have a dot product, a vector dot product with itself, that is magnitude squared. And now you should be wondering what is that absolute value? It is magnitude and we'll look at that next. Last property, if you, let's see, 
what did we say about dot product equaling zero? It's the name of the section. And if your dot product zero, your angles are perpendicular or orthogonal. Or not your angles, your vectors are perpendicular or orthogonal. However, you have to be a little careful. There's three cases. U is perpendicular to V. So these are called orthogonal. However, there are three things that can happen. It could mean your vector is orthogonal. It could mean that U is the zero vector, or it could mean that V is the zero vector. So you have to be careful. If you know that both of those vectors are not zero, then you can say they're uh, orthogonal. So you have to be a little careful. Just because your dot product is zero, that could mean one or both of your vectors are zero. In which case, it doesn't make sense to talk about direction, meaning the two vectors doesn't make sense for them to be orthogonal. So now we'll look at the magnitude of a vector. So also known as length or norm. You could say absolute value, but usually people don't use absolute value for magnitude, unless we're talking about numbers. So if we want the magnitude of a vector, we use vertical bars. Looks just like absolute value notation, but what's inside is not a number, it's a vector. And the way we compute it, so if V as components v1, v2, up to vn. Then the magnitude of v is going to be v1 squared plus v2 squared plus, etc., vn squared. Oh, and you have to take a square root. So this looks just like dot product, except dot product doesn't have a square root. So that's how the last or second to last identity on the board, that u dot u equals magnitude squared. So if you just take that square root away, you have the dot product of vector with itself. So our next theorem, if magnitude of a vector is zero, so remember, when you compute magnitude, you're squaring each of the coordinates. So your squared coordinates cannot be negative. So if you add up a bunch of positive numbers and get zero, what can you say about those positive numbers? They individually have to all be zero. So if I get the magnitude of a vector and the magnitude is zero, the vector has to be zero. All the coordinates are zero. So if magnitude is zero, then vector is the zero vector. Also, a scalar times a vector, if you take the magnitude, that's the same as the absolute value of the scalar times the magnitude of the vector. And I'll write little notes. So on the left side, we just have magnitude. And on the right side, we have absolute value of a scalar. And then we have magnitude of a vector. Let's prove the second part. Alpha V magnitude is equal to absolute value of alpha times magnitude of V. When we prove things, usually we're gonna start on one side and then work our way to the other side. In this case, I think they're both equally uh, complicated. So I'll just start on the left side and we'll work our way to the right side. So let's begin on the left. LHS stands for left hand side. So we're going to begin on left hand side. We got alpha v magnitude. 
So let's let V be V1, V2, Vn. So then alpha V is going to be alpha times this vector, V1, V2, Vn. And I'll distribute the alpha inside. So we got alpha V1, alpha V2, alpha Vn. That's the way scalar multiplication works. You distribute your scalar to all the coordinates. Now, I'm going to take the magnitude of this vector that I have. So I'll rewrite this alpha v vector on the left inside the magnitude. And the magnitude is taken with squaring each coordinate. So it's alpha v1 squared plus alpha v2 squared plus dot 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 alpha v n squared and this is all square rooted so I'm going to square each term alpha squared v1 squared I think the pattern is obvious enough to just go right to the end alpha squared vn squared square root any algebra questions on what I'm doing here? What algebraically can I do to all those alpha squares? Could say my favorite F word. Factor. So everybody's got alpha squared, so we'll factor it out. So we got alpha squared times V1 squared plus dot 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 Vn squared square root. Now I'm going to move alpha squared outside. What is missing in my algebra here? This is almost correct. So alpha might be negative, and of course if it's negative, inside the square root it gets squared, so it's gonna become positive. So if alpha is negative, when you factor it out, it would come out as positive version of alpha, so we need the absolute value there. And what is this square root right here? That's our magnitude v. That's just definition of magnitude right there. So we just showed that you can bring the alpha outside the magnitude with that work right there. And when you finish a proof, you can draw a black box and fill it in. So let's talk about unit vectors now. So unit vector has to do with the magnitude. So a unit vector has magnitude of one. So again, the word unit means, well, the prefix uni means one. So in this case, unit vector means magnitude of one. And we can take any non-zero vector and scale it to a unit vector. Let's look at this equation, alpha, magnitude of alpha v equals one. And what I wanna do is solve for alpha. All right, so I want you to solve for alpha. You got enough algebraic properties, it's pretty easy to do. We just, that last property that's at the very top of the board is step one. Break alpha out of the magnitude. So I have absolute value of alpha times magnitude of V equals one. How do I solve for alpha? Divide by the magnitude of V. 
So if I have alpha equals one over magnitude of V, what would be a very bad value for magnitude of V? Zero. So this is right here is why it won't work if magnitude of V is zero. So that's why you need the magnitude of V is not zero or you won't have valid alpha. Now it turns out when I get rid of the alpha absolute value, of course I get a plus minus, and you can choose you want to go with positive or negative version of alpha. It depends. Usually it doesn't matter unless there's more another condition you have to meet. Maybe your first term, your first coordinate needs to be positive. Uh, but there's no, there's not really positive and negative vectors anymore because they have multiple coordinates. So you can't really say that this vector is positive and this vector is negative. Uh, so that's why it becomes ambiguous. You do have to, so for example, if you have a small vector and you want it to be magnitude one, you're gonna multiply it by a larger <coughs> number. So it scales up to one. If you multiply it by a negative alpha value, it will have magnitude one, it just points the other direction. So if you go with positive alpha, it scales the same direction. If you go with negative alpha, it scales the opposite direction. So usually we'll go with a positive value, unless for some reason uh, you want it to point the other direction. And when we multiply by this value, we call that normalizing. Normalize a non zero vector. So you normalize by multiplying V by one over magnitude V. And of course, you can just write that as V over magnitude V. So that's what we call normalizing. And normalizing yields a unit vector. <coughs> So let's do an example, normalize the vector V is three, negative one, two. So step one, find magnitude of V, and then step two, divide by that magnitude. And right away, is this vector too big or too small? Like way more than length one or less than length one? I guess you have to just compute it and then you can figure it out. All right, so get the magnitude. You're just squaring each term, adding them together. And then, of course, square root at the ends. So our magnitude is square root 14, which is between three and four. It's between square root nine and square root 16. So it's way too big. And we just divide by that square root 14. And that our scale vector will be this version I have written here. I just wrote it horizontally because I didn't want to write fractions vertically, but you can of course write it vertically. You just need a bit more space. There's a couple of inequalities that I don't think we'll use very much at all. But I'm gonna write them in for completeness. So the first one is the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality.
So the magnitude or the absolute value of the dot product is less than or equal to the product of the magnitudes and the triangle inequality the magnitude of the sum of two vectors is less than or equal to the sum of the magnitudes of those vectors So the triangle inequality we'll look at geometrically really quick. If we have two vectors, u and v, if we make a triangle, but now I need one side to be u plus v. So we're using this triangle here. If we look at the magnitudes, you can kind of ignore the original vector v over there. I'll just erase it for a second so it doesn't distract us. The sum of two sides of a triangle can be no more than the third side. So the sum of two sides of a triangle, any two sides, are less than or equal to the third side. Yes. Uh, you can get a quality. When would in this particular triangle, the sum of the two sides is a little bigger than the, uh, the sum of the lengths of two sides, a little bit bigger than the third side. When would two sides added together be equal to the third side? What kind of triangle would have that property? It would be a kind of a strange triangle not one that has a name, at least not a name that I've heard in geometry. How would I get the length of u and v to equal the length of the third side? So in the triangle that's on the board, the third side's a little shorter than the sum of the other two. How could I make this side maximum length and still have a triangle? So I need my u and v to be parallel. So two sides become straight. So you can get a quality. You go u and then v, and then u plus v is like that. So that's the extreme, I guess you would call that triangle line segment. So that triangle right there is how you get a quality. Otherwise, the third side is always going to be shorter than the sum of the other two in a proper triangle. So that's where the triangle inequality comes from. And again, equality happens when basically you don't have a triangle when those two sides are parallel. We also have a cosine identity. We'll look at both the cosine and the sine identities. The cosine is the less, actually, no, we'll just go with the cosine identity. Because the sine identity uses a cross product, and I don't want to get into cross product. Nope, we are going to get into cross product. All right, we'll do cosine right now. So I'll wait for the sine inequality until we get into uh, the next section. <coughs> so here's our angle property, where theta is the angle between the vectors. What would happen if one of these vectors magnitudes were zero? What problem would I run into in my formula? So let's say magnitude u was zero. 
I would get undefined. I'd be divided by zero. So this only works when magnitude u is not zero and magnitude v is not zero. And of course you can solve for theta easily, just take cos inverse of both sides. And now we're going to look at projections. So we have a projection of one vector onto another. We'll take projection of V onto U. Now projection is where you form a right angle, or you can think of a light that's infinitely far above the vector U. And when I say infinitely far above the vector U, that means the rays of light will come down and hit perpendicularly on the vector u. So that's what I, when I say above, the rays of light will come down perpendicular on u, like it's the ground on a flat earth where the sun is infinitely far away. So our projection will be this shadow right here that'll be formed on a long vector u, and we'll use Proj, P R O J for projection, and this will project U uh, V onto U. So we're using a subscript, and it looks a lot like a logarithm with a base. So you can think of it as the base is U, what you're projecting on is U, and then the project the vector you're that forms or that creates a shadow is the vector V. So you're projecting V onto U. There's a second vector projection, it's called the orthogonal projection, and it will go, it's basically the dotted line right here. What I'm going to do is redraw it on the left, and this will be the orthogonal projection. So I'm using the same notation just with an O in front for the orthogonal projection of V on to you. What would I get if I added up the orthogonal projection and the regular projection? I wouldn't get u. I would get v. So the projection is the component of v that is parallel to you. And the orthogonal projection is the component of V that's not parallel, or that's orthogonal to U. So it's a way to break down a vector into two pieces, one going the way you want, and one going the not that way, the orthogonal direction. So let's write the equation of the projection. The projection of, of V onto U. It's going to be u dot v divided by magnitude u squared times u. The way we're going to, going to get the orthogonal projection, I'm going to add those two projections together. And we know that equals v, so I'm just going to subtract the projection to the right side. That's our orthogonal projection formula. Oh no. 
So I don't think it'll cause more problems than what I'm about to fix here. Projection formulas. I think my notes are going to go a lot further into geometry than the book goes, so I don't want to keep going more into further into geometry if our book's not going to cover it. So I may come back to do more geometry later. But I think for now, this is enough geometry. So what we're going to do next is uh, get into matrices. Do matrix operations first. And actually, before we get into matrix operations, we've done some matrix operations before. A vector uh, is, not can be considered, but is a matrix. So a vector is a matrix. If I write my vector sideways, v1, v2, vn, you could just think of this as the matrix, v1, v2, vn. So you could think of it as a matrix with one row, and then however n columns, as many columns as you need for your matrix, or for your vector. You could instead write it as a column vector, v1, v2, vn. So you have seen uh, matrices before, but all the matrices we work with had one column or one row, because they were a vector, depending on how you wrote it at the time. So we've done a little work with matrices, but now we're going to have matrices that have more than one column or more than one row. So you've done some row operations or some, uh, what have we done? Scalar, multiplication, and addition. I think are the two operations we did with vectors so far. So let's start out with the definition of a matrix. So a matrix is basically an M by N array of numbers. <coughs> the numbers are usually real, but that's not necessarily the case. You could have complex numbers, or you could be working over Z, uh, P, but it'll be some array of numbers. Now they do have to be numbers because, well they have to be objects you can add and multiply. If you can't add and multiply, you're not going to be able to do any of the ma uh, matrix operations we're going to write down. So you have to be able to add them and multiply them together. Uh, so for us they'll all be numbers. And we have M rows and N columns. And the way you should remember that RC remote control. So that's why it's always rows times columns. So rows first, columns second. It's a little weird because rows counts your vertical measurement of how big your matrix is. So you're really saying the X or the height or the Y 
coordinate first, so it's a little strange. That's why I just remember remote control, rows first, columns second. And when our vectors were a matrix, this first one was called a row matrix. And of course the other matrix would be a column matrix. And we have some shortcut notation. Well, I'll show you the horrible notation and then we'll look at shortcut notation. So if A is M by N, the first row, A11, that means row one, column one, A12 means row one, column two, what is the last entry in this first row? Is it A1M or A1N? So how many columns do we have? We got N, so this will be A1N. And now when I get to row two, I have A21, that's row two, column one, A22, dot, dot, dot. What is my last entry in second row? A2N. And now I can go dot, dot, dot. The last entry in column one, what will the subscript be on? So it'll be M1 and then a m two dot 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 a m n and you just fill in your dots now there is a big blank kind of rectangle to fill and the way you fill that is just go diagonal like this and say good enough you don't need to try to go crazy with dots like that just the three diagonal dots are good enough all right, so that's a whole lot to write. So we'll summarize it with AIJ. So when we write it like this, you know that I is the column. No, I is the row count. So I can be equal to, of course, 1, 2, and it goes up to M. And then J goes up to N. So if you're feeling lazy, you can write it out just AIJ. So that's our shortcut notation at the end. So with a shortcut notation, addition is very quick to write down. start with uh, two matrices that are the exact same size. They're both M by N matrices. So there's a couple ways to write out this sentence way faster. So we've written A and B are elements of. Now it's not quite RN or RM. There is M times N dimensions. So we could write it as r to the m times n power. So the product of m and n is how many entries there'll be inside of our matrix. So you're just going width times height, and that's the dimension of, uh, that's a number of terms. So that's the dimension your matrix will live in. And there's another notation you can use, I think, I don't know if it's in my notes. Uh, this may have been this book or the last book, I'm not sure, but you'll, you can see it in other places uh, as well. I think we put dimension in the bottom. So this mat just means matrices. The dimension will be M times N, and then R is your uh, Val R is where the numbers come from. So this will be a real coordinate, ma real coordinate matrix with M rows and columns. 
All right, so we have two matrices A and B. So A, I'm going to use a shortcut IJ notation, and then B, same thing, B, I, J. So we can add A and B together. And we get a single matrix. whose new entries are the sum of the entries that have the come from the same position in those two matrices. So this just says add the corresponding entries together and then you get a new matrix. So that's addition. Scalar, well let's write horrible notation so you can see why we won't use it. So here's a, call that shortcut notation. We'll do the uh, long form notation. A plus B, A11, A, we'll call them A1M. A, I'm writing the minimum amount I can to establish a pattern. Four is like the minimum you can establish a pattern with. Plus, do the exact same thing for the Bs. Now I'm going to add them coordinate by coordinate. So we get A11 plus B11. And our last entry will be A1M plus B1M. Bottom left, A and one plus B and one. Bottom right, A and M plus B and M. So it's the same information. You can just write it a lot quicker if you use the IJ notation. And now we have scalar multiplication. And I'm only going to use shortcut notation. So we'll do alpha A. That'll be alpha times the matrix with AIJ. And that will just be the matrix where each entry is multiplied by alpha. So alpha is distributed across each entry in the matrix. So that's addition and scalar multiplication. Let's do a fast example. So there's two steps. You have to distribute your scalar inside. I'll do the first scalar. So we have 6, 3, 21, and 0, 9, negative 12. I recommend you distribute your negative inside your second matrix. So do that, and then add the results together. So you should get one matrix at the very end. Let's do this right now. Any questions on these steps? So scalar multiplication and addition should be pretty easy to do. 
The next operation we're going to look at is multiplication. And that's where things start to get tricky. So what I'm going to do is an example instead of write out the full formula for it because there's a whole lot of subscripts that go into the formula and it gets very ugly. So I think we've done, have we done a, a little multiplication? We've done a little bit. So we'll do a just two by two, multiply by a two by two. First matrix, one, negative three, negative two, five. Second matrix, three, negative one, two, two. So it's super important to know the order. So we're going across the first, down the second, and one of the better ways to do this is put a dividing line across the first and down the second. And when we multiply, we're going across the first row, down the first column, and then we're going to add those corresponding uh, entries. So it kind of feels like you're doing little dot products as you go. So these act just like dot products here. So we have 1 times 3 plus negative 3 times 2. That's our upper left entry. Now the upper right entry, I'm going row one and column two in the second matrix. So we have one times negative one plus negative three times two. And now our lower left entry, negative two times three plus five times two. And our lower right entry, negative two times negative one plus five times two, and then just do all that arithmetic. So I have three minus six is negative three. Negative one minus six is negative seven. Negative six plus 10 is four. And then two plus 10 is 12. And if you look at dimensions here, I'll do dimensions in purple. Let's look just at the dimensions. We have two by two, multiply by two by two. The inner <coughs> dimensions have to match. So once you have those two matching, then your product dimensions are going to be your outer dimensions. Outer dimensions are the dimensions of the product. So it's pretty boring when all your dimensions are exactly the same because of course they match, but then your product dimensions will be the exact same as your starting. So we'll do our next example, we'll do them so their insides match and the outsides are different values. wait till tomorrow to do that and we'll also re-examine the dot product and you can do that with matrices.